Now, just to stay a little bit more on the data collection, there are different methods of collecting data. I just want to highlight a few. I will not go into the details. Of course, this can be another course. Just want to highlight a few of the methods that we use in, in, in collecting data. And they majorly categorize into three main categories. One is that their observation, you know, just sitting somewhere and observing trends and observing and recording in a checklist or something. So that's observation. But there are also experiments. Uh, you know, experiments could be trials, and we'll be talking about that in the next slide. Um, they, they, there are also surveys. In surveys is the most common uh, in where you go to a certain, you know, target area or population, administer a questionnaire on a group of people who have been sampled from the entire population. Or there could be also sensor. Sensor is also a part of survey where you, co you co collect information from the entire uh, group of people or, or subjects in the population. The data collection approaches also can vary from different um, uh, forms. One more, more than, and the most common is using interviews, interviews where it's administered by someone. You know, there's a, there's a respondent who is answering the questions, but there's somebody who is asking you know, the questions. And this can be both qualitative and quantitative. Quantitative, this is where you are collecting numerical information or quantitative information. And qualitative is where you are moderating a conversation, you know, maybe through a focus group discussion or key informant interviews. So as I say, um, you know, these different methods can be handled in a, actually a different class, a long class, but this just to mention, um, just to highlight them. And there could be also self-administered surveys. After COVID-19, uh, it taught us a lesson that actually it's possible to collect data online, you know, and right now there's a lot of um, forms, even from, uh, you know, from social functions, from, you know, you just have a Google form and, you know, people are collecting this data. I'm mentioning this because you you see, as, I, as I'll be mentioning in the next slides, how do you ensure protection? How do you ensure that the data that is administered online through a Google form or through Survey Monkey? And, and some of these Google Forms, as you may have seen them, is that they ask you to enter your name and they will may ask you some information. Then they make it restricted that you have to enter before you proceed. In fact, there are some that you have to collect your, your, your email address. And the email address can be regarded as, as personal data because it, it may tell where, if, if, it's a, if it's a work email address, it may tell where you work and it may also tell your name. You know, so how do you ensure that these data are protected? And sometimes they are restricted. You have to enter some information before you proceed. Checklists that are used mostly during observations. So somebody is sitting somewhere and entering a checklist. But there's also some very sensitive information that are collected, you know, and this could be biological sample collection uh, methods, you know, um, that, are, that are used. So these are just some of the approaches that are commonly used. Now, direct observation. So this is where a researcher or, or, or an observer just sits somewhere or watches and listens to the study participants, uh, mostly to observe some behavior, uh, you know, and they are mostly used in ethnographic studies um, and, and also in other research activities, actually. You just sit and observe behavior and observe how things are done. Sometimes they can be used when you are uh, doing an assessment of an, an assessment of something. You know, for example, you are assessing, you know, the monitoring and evaluation system. You are just going to check how how people document their data, how people, you know, and they and it may be used together with other 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 methods of data collection, including questionnaires and so on. But observation is a very common practice uh, that's done. So there are two major types. One is called overt, and the other one is called covert. Overt is where the research participant being observed is aware that there's somebody who is observing me. Uh, and this one is mostly uh, those who, those of us who went through, uh, okay, at least I can speak from the Kenyan system of education. You know, when for somebody who is doing education as their study, they will, they, 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 you, 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 you do what we call um, teaching practice or attachment. And in your uh, attachment or practice, somebody will come, uh, that's an assessor, your examiner, will come and sit somewhere at the back of the class and just observe how you are teaching. You know, you are aware the observer is there, 
they are marking something on their notebook. They are just observing how you are teaching. So that's overt. But covert is also, is also another type of observation where the participant does not know that they are being observed. So most of the time, this is it elicits the most, the truest kind of behavior because it gets a person or a participant in their most natural, um, you know, um, state. So they don't know that they are being observed because if you know that you are being observed, obviously it may influence how you behave. Now, observational studies. Observational studies. Um, involves observing individuals' behavior. I talked about this already. So it can provide insights around patterns of behavior, um, you know. But also, a question that we need to ask ourselves is, how do ethical considerations play in these observational studies? So as you design your study, depending on the type of study design and the methods that you choose to use, collect your data and to capture your information, the question that should always be in the mind, because five, 10 years from now, this will be a really, really important topic. How do you ensure that data are, of these participants are protected and that this participant's privacy is ensured? Now, in clinical trials, and in other uh, research, of course, there are most most often clinical trials. We use experiments, you know. Um, so, for example, an example which is very, uh, I think, an example that I think is very co is, is is very is very very recent is when we were developing the COVID nineteen vaccine. You know, maybe this is, and and, and you, may, you may think about any new drug. You know, you take some participants. And, and and give them the new drug that you're testing. But some participants, you have them as a control so that you can, at the end of the study, you can compare, did the new drug work or it works or, or it didn't work? Like it's just exactly the same as the people who did not receive the new drug. So that is an experiment where a, a, a researcher manipulates a variable under study and tests the outcomes at the end of the study. So these mostly happens in a laboratory setting, in a controlled environment, uh, so to speak. And the choice of this, um, you know, and the choice on the location of this experiment, uh, of course, relies on the scope and, and the research questions of your study. And there are many other types of, of experiments. Of course, there's the randomized control trials uh, that is uh, at the highest level. And then we have other, other types of experiments like um, quasi-experimental designs, that we may not have the time to discuss at this stage. But the question that you always need to think about as we discuss this is, how do you ensure that the data and the participants are protected and that you are adhering to the required ethical practices and the data protection laws, and that you are not breaching any privacy of the participants? You know, issues about benefits and harms, I'll mention that as I'll be discussing the concept. Surveys, these are one of the most common um, methods of data collection. It involves administering standardized questionnaires or scales. And we'll be, uh, and when I mention scales here, uh, in, the, in the mental health uh, space, we're talking about PHQ, you know, patient health questionnaire tools, PHQ 9, PHQ 7 or 2. We have GUARD tool for anxiety, you know, and all these tools that are used to, to, to measure different mental health conditions. They are mostly administered in a survey, you know, because you have some participants and then you ask them to rate or to tell you about how their experiences were. For example, PHQ-9, how their experiences were in the past two weeks, in the past 14 days, how have they been feeling about, you know, how their, their mental health situation when you're talking about different mental health conditions. So that is mostly, uh, most of the time, it's administered in a survey. So there's a questionnaire for that tool that's administered by somebody asking the questions, and then the respondent asks. Also, there are participants, or there are some situations where this can be self-administered. I have answered this before, where a questionnaire is sent to my email, and then I am asked to 
administer to, to to read the question and enter the response that fits you know my truest response considering maybe the past two weeks in the case of phq9 so this kind of method it provides information about experiences perceptions you know prevalence risk factors um and you know um treatment preferences because it's an interaction you know and i can be thinking about what i like and my opinions my perceptions can be conducted in person i said uh, where you have an interviewer and an interviewee kind of conversation you can be convert con conducted over the phone i remember during covid-19 where there were so many restrictions about in person interactions uh, we had to researchers across the world actually we had to change how we collect data and so we decided we, we started collecting data over the phone you know design the questionnaire and then have a database of participants you call the participant the participant gives you the questions i mean the answers over the phone there's no physical interaction so that also happens online is where you have you know a questionnaire sent on email or or through other means but this type of questions mostly suffer from what we call bias because it relies on self report self reports it's it's me who is reporting as a respondent you know so it may have response bias. A response bias here can be issues around non-response, where you've sent up, you've sent ten questionnaires, but only five come. How, how do you use that? You know, um, only only so that means fifty percent response rate. So how do you handle issues of missing data and non-response? That in that case. So there's also social desirability bias. You know, I will answer depending on how I think that my answer will you know will result to something good for me for example if it's a service you know i will not answer and i will not answer in a way that will make me not to get a service you know there's that possibility in 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 service so how do you manage those kind of biases that happen so there's a link here that you can read more about this but the question the bigger question in this context is how do you ensure data is protected the in integrity ethics you know privacy and all those things that we are discussing about data governance and data privacy are adhered to so data acquisition and integrity i mean integrity and quality in data acquisition so very important and i alluded to this earlier in in the in in, in my earlier slides that it's very important to have clear data collection procedures consistent you know, and standardized across all the data sources. If you are having different time points for longitudinal data, ensure that they are standardized and you have thought, thoroughly thought through, and, and, and all your teams are actually in line with that. And the, the data collectors are trained and adequately trained. So many times it's also important to even do um, data quality assessment before even collecting the data from the pilot study that you conduct before uh, before the actual data collection you know just conducting some quality assessment and consistency assessments to just ensure that these data collectors have a common understanding i have had an experience before where you have a question um 70 percent of the of the interviewers have understood your question in a certain way and they are administering me administering the questions to the respondents in that way but 30% of your interview interviewers have understood the question in a totally different way and they administer the questions that way. And especially when you're talking about mental health. For example, PHQ, where you have a question about how do you how did you how do you how do looking back at the last 14 days, have you felt, you know, in this way? And there are several questions there. And then People do not do not do not have a common understanding about when is when do you say mild when do you say um, moderate when do you say severe when you don't have that diff, you know uh, kind of uh, alignment or consistency that there may be a problem um, when you're analyzing your data at the end because you have fourteen days so between zero to seven days seven to four, seven to fourteen days what about if somebody who says none none 
does none mean zero? Does none mean zero and one day? Does it mean zero, one, two days? People may have different understandings of, about that. So you need to really make sure that the trainings are really adequate and thorough so that um, I, I, and do some tests to ensure that they have a common understanding about that. Develop and validate your data collection tools to ensure the reliability and validity. I think that goes without saying. I've, 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 I've mentioned that quite often. Um, standard entry procedures to minimize errors and inconsistencies. And of course, we are looking at electronic data capture tools here. You know, when we have said that we are all submitting data at the end of the day or immediately after you collect the data, and then that is the common understanding amongst your teams. And it's important to monitor the data collection process. And that is why it's, it's important to have at least somebody who is like a team leader who is just overseeing the process in the field um, and to, as a liaison person between the people collecting the data and, and the people who are receiving the data in the office. It's important to have this, this kind of layers of, of, of quality check because it, it, will, it helps to capture issues early. And it's not only about data quality. Here we're talking about issues of adherence to um, data protection law adherence to the standard operating procedures, adherence to the ethical considerations that you, you signed up to. In fact, right now, many um, IRBs, you know, they actually have a form that you have to sign called data protection agreement, you know, that everybody has to form, sign, uh, everybody who is within the data, who is handling the data. Uh, as you submit your protocol, some you know from the principal investigator all the way down, you have to sign that from for data protection agreement, you know, or non disclosure agreement, so to speak. How do you ensure that this actually happens? Because it's one 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 thing to sign is another thing to actually do it. So this needs to be somebody who is ensuring that happens. Monitor this process, monitor compliance, and there's a link here again that you can look at. Um, uh, to, to, to read more about that. Now, we've talked about ethical considerations, and I would like to bring in a new issue here, which, uh, and, and you'll forgive me, I have seen this actually breached uh, quite often, especially for academic, um, academic um, uh, work, you know, master's students collecting data. This issue of informed consent actually is very important. So what is informed consent? Informed consent, uh, just to define it, is a legal process that brings the researcher and the participant to a conversation. And this conversation helps the, in, you know, and, and mark the word there, informed. You are informing the research participant about your study with the intention to convince, okay, not convince, not, not coerce them, with the intention to ask them for voluntary participation. You're asking them, this is the study we are conducting. You have been selected because, you know, they fit the criteria and you are asking them to participate in this study. You are telling them about the benefits. You are asking openly telling them about any risks that may be associated with the study. You know, you are telling them how you are going to handle their data, issues of confidentiality and privacy. You are telling them how the data will be used. You are even giving your, your address, your contact information there. You are telling them that this study has been approved by a certain, you know, in, uh, IRB, Institutional Review Board or Ethics Review Committee. You are basically describing the entire study and the process that you have gone through and what will happen after and asking them to participate. Now, their participation is voluntary. It's voluntary because they can decide to participate or not. And when they decide not to participate, if that study is, a, is, is tied to some service provision, uh, especially uh, or, or, or services you know, in the government or something, that they are decline to participate should not in any way interfere with their continued re uh, receiving of the service uh, that they are that 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 um that um that they receive you know so it's a conversation and that conversation needs not to be rushed it needs to be to the extent that the participant has understood uh, 
about the informed consent. It's informed consent. So you are informing and then you are asking them for their consent and they may decide to consent or not. And their pros and so this consenting in the in, in the digital world, you you know, sometimes it may happen electronically, and there's electronic way you can sign the consent forms. But traditionally or conventionally, the informed consent actually there is a paper that is done in duplicates where after you have explained everything, the participant will have to append their signature in both documents. You keep one 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 copy of the document and the other copy uh, remains with the participant so that they can uh, continue reading. And they can change their participation. They can decide to participate in the first wave of the study and in the second wave, they decide not to, you know, it's all voluntary and, and that one has to be very clear to them. And the ethics considerations or practices um, actually uh, says that we need to do that. Now, what, are, what do you do? when you are doing this. So you have to, in, when you're conduct, conducting your study, avoid or minimize anything that will cause physical or emotional harm to the participants. Remain neutral and unbiased so that you don't coerce your participants to participate in the study because you don't want your preconceptions or opinions to interfere, in, sorry, interfere with their, in their, their decision-making process to participate in the study. And also, even in the way the study goes, you know, your opinions or your preconceptions they need to be neutral because you want to get the information from the study. So respect people's time. Um, if possible, you can compensate them for their time um, and the compensation ways actually can be discussed. Um, of course, there are ethics, ethical review committees that actually require you to tell or say, if you are going to give them um, some money for their time, how much exactly are you going to give? So that's also very important to put there. And how and, and whether that money is not going to coerce the participants to participate because participation is voluntary. Um, be sure to protect the data you collect, but, but how? And this is where I think in the next kind of trainings we need to be focusing on is exactly the how. When we say protect, and the legal, the legal, the lawyer will say, make sure you so pseudonymize, you anonymize. But exactly how? How does it exactly work? Practically, when you have the data, how does it exactly work? So that is uh, what we need to uh, to be focusing on. Of course, uh, it's important to be aware that um, there is now data protection offices that are keenly following, and they are actually, you know, slowly by slowly getting very strong um, to follow these things. <clears throat> 